On one occasion near the end of our Lord's ministry here on earth, the Jewish leaders tried to tra- trap Jesus with a loaded question. And the loaded questions are questions that are designed in such a way that you get into trouble regardless of how you answer the question. There's one very, very well-known loaded question. Let me put that up for you. This loaded question is this. Have you stopped beating your wife? Now that's a loaded question. Because if you answer yes, then it means that you were a wife beater. (laughs) And if you answer no, that means you are still a wife beater. So yes or no, you're nailed. That's a loaded question. Now the loaded questions the Jewish leaders asked Jesus was this. Jesus, they asked, Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now the reason this was a loaded question was because any way Jesus answered the question, it would get him into trouble. If Jesus said that it was wrong to pay taxes to Rome, he would have been accused of encouraging a rebellion against Rome, which is something he did not want to do. He didn't come to start a rebellion against the civil authorities. He's going to do that when he comes back at the end of the tribulation, but not right now. Now, if Jesus said that it was right to pay taxes to Rome, it would have gotten him into trouble with the people because the people hated paying taxes to Rome, and the people if, would, have start, would have started turning against Jesus if he had said it's right to pay taxes. And this, of course, is what the Jewish leaders wanted. The people were following Jesus, and they wanted him to say, oh, it's right to pay taxes to Rome, and the people would turn against him. The loaded question the Jewish leaders asked is found in Matthew chapter 22. And in in this chapter we also find our Lord's brilliant answer to their loaded question. Some of you are familiar with it, but it's always worth repeating. Now tell us, these are the Jewish leaders asking Jesus a question, now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said, why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply amazed them as it should, and they went away. I'm so glad God is smart. In a world full of fools leading us, it's just good to know someone really, really smart is running things. Now, as we've just seen, the Jewish leaders were not successful in trapping Jesus. And not only were they not successful in trapping Jesus with their loaded question, Jesus, it seems, got into the spirit of asking loaded questions. It's sort of like, you ask me a loaded question, I'll ask you one. And... uh, As you can expect, Jesus was a whole lot more successful in trapping them with his loaded question than they were in trapping him with their loaded question. In fact, he was so successful in trapping them with his loaded question that from that point forward, they just stopped asking him questions. Smart on their part. Our Lord's loaded question is also recorded in Matthew 22. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ, that is the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, now here he quotes the first verse of the 110th Psalm. David said, The Lord, that is God the Father, said to my Lord, that is the Messiah, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If then, Jesus continues, if if then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. From that, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Takes him a while to wise up, but that's true of most of us. Now, our Lord's loaded question was, of course, designed to do more than silence the Jewish leaders. It was designed to teach them and by extension teach us that the Messiah would not only be the son of David, but would also be the son of God. Jesus actually asked the 
Pharisees two questions. But only one of the questions was a loaded question. Jesus' first question was relatively easy to answer, and it was not loaded. His first question was this, whose son is the Messiah? Whose son is the Messiah? The Pharisees correctly answered this question by saying that he would be the son of David. The second question was much more difficult to answer. How, he asked, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls the Messiah Lord? Wait a minute, the Messiah is the son of David, but David calls him Lord. And it was at this point that Jesus quoted the first verse of Psalm 110. The Lord, that is God the Father, said to my Lord, that is the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now to understand the problem, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus, Jesus was presenting to the Pharisees, you need to understand that the tradition in ancient times was to treat earlier generations as being greater and wiser than the present generation. This being the case, no father would ever call his son or grandson or great-grandson Lord, nor would anyone expect him to. Not only that, in calling the Messiah Lord, David used a word the Jews used as a substitute for the word Jehovah, the personal name for God. And to top this off, David wrote that the Messiah would be sitting at God's right hand, a place no man sits. Now, the only way to explain what David was saying is to recognize that King David was declaring that the Messiah would be more than a mere man. He would have been both son of David and son of God. Jesus built his entire argument in support of the deity of the Messiah on the first verse of Psalm 110, a psalm that David wrote a thousand years earlier. It's also worth noting <clears throat> that the Pharisees refused to answer Jesus' question. They could have just said, okay, son of David, son of God. But they refused. And the reason they refused to answer this question was because the only answer they could give would be to admit that the 110th Psalm was declaring that the Messiah would be God. And this was something the Jewish leaders did not want to do because their major charge against Jesus in their effort to have him executed was that he claimed to be God. So, if they admitted that the Messiah was God, they could hardly criticize Jesus for claiming to be God, if at the same time he did claim to be the Messiah. So they remained silent. Don't forget that just two days earlier, on the day Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, thousands of Jewish pilgrims had proclaimed Jesus to be the Messiah. And if the Pharisees now admitted that the Messiah would also be God, they would be in no position to criticize Jesus for claiming to be God. Is Jesus smart or what? So they remain silent. Let me summarize. The Jewish leaders had this problem. They wanted to charge Jesus, the Jewish leaders were going to charge Jesus with blasphemy because he claimed to be God, and claiming to be God is blasphemy, and it was punishable by death. But the Jewish leaders had a problem. Two days earlier, thousands of Jews declared that Jesus was the Messiah, and now Jesus was pointing out to them that in 100, Psalm 110, David said the Messiah would be God. Therefore, if the Jewish leaders said that Jesus was not the Messiah, the crowds would turn on them. Thousands, two days early, said, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. And the, the, the Jewish leaders got up and said, no, he isn't. They just said, we don't like you. They'd have been in trouble. So if the Jewish leaders said that Jesus was not the Messiah, the crowds would turn on them. If, on the other hand, the Jewish leaders said that the Messiah was not God, David and the Psalms would turn on them. So, guess what? They just didn't say anything. And they stopped asking him questions. And now back to the 110th Psalm. Psalm 110 was not only a psalm Jesus used to silence the Pharisees and to teach us about the deity of the Messiah. It is also the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. No psalm is quoted more often in the New Testament than the 110th Psalm. One scholar wrote that by his count, Verse 
1 was quoted or alluded to at least 27 times in the New Testament. Now, obviously, the 110th Psalm was a very important psalm to New Testament writers. And as you might have guessed by now, we'll be looking at the 110th Psalm this morning. In this psalm of only seven verses, the psalmist presents the Messiah Jesus in essentially three ways. First, the psalmist tells us that the Messiah Jesus is the waiting king who is seated at the right hand of God the Father where he is waiting to receive his kingdom. The psalmist then tells us that the Messiah Jesus is the eternal high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And finally, the psalmist tells us that the Messiah Jesus is the warrior judge who will crush the rulers and nations of this earth who have been rebelling against God. With that introduction, let's begin. David began his psalm by telling us that Jesus Christ is the war, war excuse me, is the waiting king who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, where he is waiting to receive his kingdom. Let's read through that. First three verses. The Lord, that is God the Father, says to my Lord, the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. You are arrayed in holy garments, and your strength will be, will be, excuse me, will be, will be, I typed it badly, sorry, will be renewed each day like the morning dew. Now after Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave, he ascended into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Most of us know about this because it's an event that we have been told about over and over again throughout the New Testament. It's a very popular piece of information. Ephesians 1.20, God's power was exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, the right, at his right hand in heavenly realms. Colossians 3, 1, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We could go on and on. Most of you are aware of the fact that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Now, there are six important points that the psalmist makes in the first three verses of Psalm 110. The first point is that David's son, the Messiah, will also be David's Lord and his God. We discussed this in the introduction. The second point is that Jesus Christ is presently in a place of great authority and power. We know this to be the case because he is sitting at the right hand of God the Father and sitting at the right hand of a ruler is a place, historically, of great authority and power. Peter expressed this idea when he said, Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers, in submission to him. This is something God wants us to know about. He wants us to know about it because when Jesus was here on earth 2,000 years ago, he spent 30-odd year, odd years in humility. He spent 30-odd years without any apparent power or authority. He spent 30-odd years in submission to the earth's ruling authorities. In telling us that Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, God is telling us in no uncertain terms that our Lord's days of humility have ended. He is now in a place of great authority and is waiting to take charge of the earth. What a glorious day that will be. Now the third point the psalmist makes in the first three verses is that God is presently in the process of bringing Christ's enemies on earth into submission. This is what the expression, making your enemies your footstool, is getting at. Let me explain. In the days of antiquity, a conquering king would stand on the necks of the rulers he had defeated in battle. 
He did this, that is standing on their necks, as a way of showing that he had defeated them and that they were now under his control. So when God the Father told Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, he was telling Jesus that he was in the process of bringing Jesus' enemies into submission and that he was going to place them under our Lord's direct control. Now some of you are saying to yourselves, why is he taking so long? (laughs) I have to confess, sometimes I ask the same question. Couldn't he have defeated Christ's enemy sooner? The answer is yes, of course he could. He could have defeated Christ any time, his, his enemies any time he wanted. He could have defeated them 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or 500 years ago. But if he had, where would you and I be? Yeah, now it gets a little selfish and we, we don't mind it, see? When I start getting selfish, I can tell, oh, thanks for the delay. I'm glad he waited 2,000 years. God is taking thousands of years to defeat his enemy so that he might have the opportunity to gather more and more people to himself. I'm glad he waited. I'm glad he waited these thousands of years because this wait has enabled you and me to be part of God's wonderful kingdom. And I'm glad I'm part of God's wonderful kingdom. It's going to be glorious, folks. I believe what the Bible tells me. When God says, David, you have no idea. And I have a vivid imagination. I mean, I grew up on Star Wars, so of course I've got an imagination. (laughs) And he says, David, believe me. You have no idea. I believe him. It's going to be fabulous. But he had to wait 2,000 years for me. Now now I'm ready to go, right? (laughs) The fourth point the psalmist makes in these first three verses is that Jesus will rule the world from Mount Zion, verse 2a. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Mount Zion is the mountain on which the city of Jerusalem was built, and it will be from this city and this mountain that Jesus Christ will rule the world when he returns to earth at the end of the tribulation. The fifth point the psalmist makes in these first three verses is that Jesus will still have enemies during his millennial reign on earth. Verse 2b, you will rule in the midst of your enemies. Now, it's important to note that those enemies will not have the upper hand, certainly not the upper hand that they have today. During the millennium, Jesus Christ will control them completely and totally. The writer of the second psalm put it this way, you will rule them with an iron scepter, you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Now some of you might be wondering why Jesus Christ will have enemies during his millennial reign on earth. Let me explain. When Jesus returns to earth at the end of the tribulation to set up his millennial kingdom on earth, he will send out his angels to separate the sheep from the goats, that is, believers from non-believers. The non-believers will cast, be cast into the abyss where they will wait for their final judgment. The believers, which are the men and women who became Christians during the tribulation, they will go into the millennium with their natural bodies. Now, at the beginning of the tribulation, no believers, because we're all raptured. But during the tribulation, Tens of millions will come to salvation, and those who survive will go into the millennium in their natural bodies. And they will have children during the millennium, and many of these children, strange as it seems, will not accept Christ as their Savior. And they will be enemies of Jesus Christ. And it is these enemies that the psalmist is writing about in verse 2 when he wrote, The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. The sixth point the psalmist makes in these first three verses is that Jesus will lead an army of volunteers when he returns to earth. Verse 3, your troops will be willing on your day of battle. A volunteer army, willing. When Jesus returns to earth, he will lead an army of men and women who will be eager to follow him into battle. This army of volunteers will be made up of believers from throughout history. This army of volunteers 
will include all of the men and women in this room who know Christ as their Savior. So, even though most of us aren't like the Natcos and know how to ride horses, we will know. And if you don't, speak to Bill in the back. We're going to come on horses. Now, some of you think, don't think of yourself as a warrior. When you get your new body, there won't be a problem. We're going to follow our Lord back. We'll be his army taking charge of the earth. <clears throat> the cultural movement of our society today is against evangelical Christians. Those days are soon, will soon end. David began this psalm by telling us that Jesus Christ is the waiting king who is seated at the right hand of God the Father where he is waiting to receive his kingdom. He then tells us that Jesus is the eternal high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, in the Old Testament economy, kings came from the tribe of Judah, and priests came from the tribe of Levi. God separated the offices of priests and kings because he did not want one man to be both priest and king. God did this for a number of reasons. To begin with, he did not want the priesthood to be compromised by politics. He did not want the priesthood to be compromised by politics. He did not want his religious leaders to be politicians. And he also did this because he knew that the power of being both a priest and a king was too much for a sinful man. He'd be corrupted by it. But in the case of Jesus Christ, the sinless God-man, there will be no problem with one man being a priest and a king. So God made Jesus Christ not only king of kings and lord of lords, but also our great high priest, a high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice for us. His other high priests offered up animals. This high priest, this magnificent high priest said, I'll take care of your sins once and for all. I offer myself as a sacrifice. And as such... He is our high priest, and he will remain our high priest forever. Because Jesus Christ is both a king and a priest, he stands in the tradition of a man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest and a king who lived during the time of Abraham. He was a king who ruled over a city called Salem. Later, it became known as Jerusalem. And Jesus will follow in his tradition. Jesus will be a king and a priest, and he will rule from the same city that Melchizedek lived and ruled from. Presently, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's waiting to receive his kingdom. And not only is he waiting to receive his kingdom, but he will come as a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. David closes his psalm by telling us that Jesus is the great warrior judge who will one day come to earth with his heavenly army and execute judgment against the wicked rulers who have been rebelling against God for thousands of years. Verses 5 through 7, The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. But he himself will be refreshed from the brooks along the way. He will be victorious. What does it mean to have a victorious king? We've got a winner. <laughs> he not only is going to rule the world in righteousness, he's a priest who sacrificed himself on our behalf. How could you do better than that? This last point. It's a warning to all men that one day God is going to crush the world's rebellion against the living God. It is as though Jesus was saying, God has allowed you to have your way with me, but only for a few days. I will arise from the dead. I will ascend to heaven. I will sit at the right hand of God the Father, and then I will return to earth and crush the world's rebellion. For the moment... God has allowed wicked men to have their way. But this will not last. There is, as we speak, a warrior king getting ready to come to earth to crush this rebellion. 
The only way to uh, escape this terrible judgment is to make Jesus Christ your high priest. And you do that by accepting the sacrifice he made on your behalf. My prayer is that you will do just that. It's your only hope, and it's a glorious hope. What a glorious hope to embrace the one who sacrificed himself for me. And he wants to give me a glorious future. I don't understand why everybody doesn't grab hold of this. The men in the sinful hearts want nothing to do with them. How terribly sad. I hope that isn't true for any of you. I hope not. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for this glorious king and priest. We are so thrilled to be part of his kingdom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.